I want to invite Debbie and the Rivera family to come up. Yeah, isn't that just like a pastor's family? They hardly sit together. <laughs> we'll, we'll just do it right down here. I want to invite uh, Shirlene, if she's still in here, to also be a part of this. I said to Elizabeth today, you've turned into a young lady. <laughs> she liked that. As I look at Samuel, he's uh, outgrown his dad, and that's okay, because we want better things for our kids. And... Uh, I appreciate it. I think the first time I met Joshua, if I'm not sure, it was a conference room at Andrews University, and he was in a carrier, and he was put on the conference table as I was interviewing Luis. I've had the privilege of watching your family grow. I've seen them grow in stature, and I've seen them grow in the things of God. I had the privilege of calling Luis into ministry, and now, in a small way, I've had the privilege of watching you be called into ministry as well. And, um, you know, there are, there are people who go to church, and there are people that live their life in church. And Debbie, you're one of those. Your family is one of those. And I think it, it has been not only a blessing to your family, but it, it will bless you guys for all the years to come. You're being today, you've been elected as an elder, and so I get to be a part of the ordination process. In a few weeks, the conference administration will come and will install you as a pastor. A lot of changes are taking place in your life, but yet not so much. Because you have always had that call. Today is kind of, an acknowledgement of that is an affirmation that the call that you have felt in your own life to serve God's church has been recognized by your church. And I don't know what the future holds for you, but one day there may be a commissioning service where the world church acknowledges the call that you have demonstrated in your life. You already probably know everything you're getting into, and yet you're still here. And that's an amazing thing. But you get called to minister to really the, the most special group of people that are here in our church. Over the last four years, we've dedicated much ministry to our young people. Uh, and while some would say we've spent a lot of money, that really isn't true. More than we had been. But when you consider the dollars that we invest in inviting our community to come and hear about Jesus... What we spend in children's ministry is a fraction of that. And yet these are our own kids. Anna today being baptized. Your children being baptized in that same baptistry not long ago. This is what it's about. So be an advocate. Be a defender. Stand in front of the board and demand more money. No, I'm just kidding you. <laughs> sort of. Sort of kidding you. Because... You know, we talk about the church, the young people being the church of tomorrow. They're not. They're our church today. They're our greatest resource and our greatest treasure. And you get to be that voice. You get to be the one to journey with them from, you know, the smallest age to the age where you lead them to accept Jesus. And uh, I, we pray for your ministry, Debbie. And so today it's a privilege to be able to ordain you as an elder. I want to invite our leadership team to come up. You know all about this. This is not about position or power. This is about influence. And God is going to use your influence to influence his kingdom. And this isn't just about growing his church. This is about leading young people to know Jesus and to accept Jesus. Um, far too many churches are absent young people today because for whatever reason we haven't created a climate where they feel welcome and nourished and nurtured 
And I hope that you will always be that person that will be the voice of the children that in many committees and other places never have a voice. But this is about serving, and I know you know that. The office of an elder is not about what we receive, but what we give. Elders who serve well bring honor to the Lord. They bring honor to his church. They bring honor to his kingdom. And so we want to challenge you today to be faithful to uh, the call that you're answering today, to serve with a team of elders who are all committed in moving in the same direction, to prepare people and to prepare this community for the coming of Christ. And so it's a privilege today to lay hands on you and to welcome you to this ministry of, of an elder. And so I want to invite the congregation to bow your heads and... Uh, I'll do it right here. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege this morning of all of the things that we have celebrated. And maybe it's fitting that we just recognized and set aside time for Anna to be baptized. To do this um, service right now in the wake of that experience because we know that's what being a servant of Christ is about. That's what the church is about, leading men and women, boys and girls, to make a decision for Christ. There is no greater and higher calling than that. And we recognize that as Debbie accepts this position as elder in this church, that you're going to use her in a powerful way. Father, we're praying that you will build her up. Being a leader in the church is not just about the good times. It's not just about all of the celebrations. It's rolling up your sleeves and working many, many hours when no one knows. It is handling complaints and challenges and struggles. It's spending a lot of time with tears coming down your face that no one sees but Jesus. Father, we pray that you will help her to be faithful to the greatest and highest calling of, of all, to spend time with Jesus every day so she has grace and love to share that you will build her up to be the woman of god you called her to be and that she will be an influencer for your kingdom that many many young people will be in your kingdom because of her work i pray that you will help her to inspire others to rise up and to be champions for the ministries that we have here in our church that you will empower her and equip her to equip others and Lord, we look forward to what you will do. We look forward to the day when all of this work is done. And part of that multitude that no man can number will be people that she has ministered to. I pray your blessings upon her and to her family. We lay our hands upon her, recognizing your call to her to serve as an elder of this church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, Debbie. Guys, blessings, blessings. I have a certificate here for you, Debbie. God bless you. All right, I'm going to take a few minutes, and I'm going to share a few words. Uh, I was looking for someone because I wanted to, uh, to, to publicly make the announcement, but Keith Russell back there with headphones on, ministering to the other congregation that joins us every week, the one that watches us online through Facebook and YouTube and our website and our app. Got married a couple weeks ago. Is Christina is not here? Christina isn't here? All right, well, we'll embarrass you officially later. But uh, wel welcome to the uh, club. Please pray for Christina <laughs> and for Keith, that he will be a godly husband, that God will richly bless them. I don't want to take too long because much has already been said. So just a few words. Three o'clock tomorrow morning, getting up early, packing a bag, getting a ride to the airport. Um, and while I'll leave, 
you'll be on my mind. You'll be in my prayers. So I have a few words that I want to share with you. I've got my Kleenex ready. A charge, if you will. Because I believe that if you and I are both faithful to what I'm going to share, one day we won't say goodbye. And so while I am leaving, I'm asking you to stay. First, I want you to stay in his word. God has given to us the greatest gift of all. It is the most underappreciated gift Christianity has ever received. We don't even carry it around anymore because, well, we've got our phones and other things, and there's nothing wrong with that. But God's word, God has spoken to you. It is not an accident that in case you haven't figured it out, there has been deliberate intentionality to focus on the Word throughout our ministry here, to get you and I committed to read the Word, memorize the Word. In case you haven't noticed, I'm a preacher who preaches the Word. Very few stories, and not that I have issues with that, but what have I got to say that would be more important than the Word of God? It is the power of God that can be released in your life. It is what brings men and women to faith. It is that that creates faith in us. It grows faith. And when that faith is born in us, it causes us to become a child of God. I want to invite you to fill your heart with the Word of God. It will speak to every need every need you have in your life, every challenge you face, every obstacle that you will confront, you can find direction, wisdom, guidance, comfort, solace. You can find it all in the Word of God. Something amazing happens when you open the Word of God. You may be alone in the middle of the dark hours of the morning or evening, alone in your prayer closet, and you open the Word of God, something special happens. You're no longer by yourself, but all of heaven's influence comes and has the power to speak to you. I want you to allow the Word to wash over your soul. Don't be content to have it in your home, to carry it in your car, to have it on your phone. Get it in your heart. Get it in your life. I really believe that. That every single day and every single situation, God has something to say to you. And He has cho chosen first and foremost to do it through His Word. But what does it say when the people of God go a day or days or even weeks, and they don't open the Word. What does that say about who we are as a people? What does that say to Jesus? Opening a door is like opening the Bible, and God honors that. And the promise is that if you will open the door, He will come in. I invite you to stay in his word. Number two, I want you to stay in his spirit. For the last several months, knowing what was happening and knowing what was in our future, I've been looking for ways to talk to you about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of God's spirit that has been promised to every believer. The greatest power this world has ever seen. I've said it, and I'll say it one more time. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, that Spirit of God is available to you and I as believers. Don't talk to me about being weak. Don't talk to me about being helpless. Don't talk to me about having no power, because God has promised it to you. It is through the miracle of the Holy Spirit. When you and I gave our heart to the Lord, we invited the Spirit of God to come. To be not only the presence and power of God in us, but to lead us, empower us, and to grow us. 
If you've been born again, you've been born of the Spirit. You are a spiritual being. You live in a physical realm, yes. But there is a dimension to you that is unseen to the human eye. We are told about principalities and powers, things of a world and and a dimension that few ever know about, but we do. And the promise of God is that He will fill you with every spiritual blessing that you need. Friends, life is hard. Life will become more difficult. There are challenges that are out there, but the power of God will reside in the most humble person. The Spirit of God wants to grow in your heart. I want to invite you to stay in His Spirit. To be Spirit-filled. To be Spirit-led. To grow in spiritual things. Here's number three. Stay in His church. I've shared the church has been such a blessing to me every church I've ever been a part of every church from the first one to this one and I believe there's more out there there's more for me and there's more for you wherever you go be a part of God's church It has mothered me. It has blessed me. As I reflect over four years of ministry here, the other day I was walking through the building and I was looking at all the walls that we've painted, all the furniture we've bought, all the ceiling tiles we have replaced. Just last week, I made my last visit to the roof, to take care of a gutter, and, and all of that. And as I looked out over that brand new roof, I, I, you know, and the landscape, and every room, the kitchen, the gymnasium, all of that, just walking from one corner to the next, and in a sense celebrating the newness of the building. That's not what, that's not what the church is. That's not what this is about. Those are nothing more than tools. The church of the living God is bigger than a building. I don't want to be remembered because we had a makeover of this building. I don't want my ministry just to be about the finances that we have worked on together. I leave here... Well, I was going to say, I leave here with no debt. Let me say it this way. I leave here not having incurred any debt. You had a debt when I got here, and and there remains a debt, although it is much less than it was. We are strong financially, and that's simply because of the faithfulness of God's people. But that isn't what this four years have been about. It's not about that. I believe with all of my heart, this church is its people. It's you and I who come together having a something in common that is more than where we were born and what we look like and how much money we make or where we live. There is some common bond that brings us together that every time we come here we can celebrate unity because we love Jesus. And He loves us. This church is God's gift to you. God's gift to you. God exists in community. In Genesis chapter 1, we see it. It starts out with God, and within just a verse or two, it's our and us, because God knows we were built in His image, so He gives us the church, a place where we journey in the Christian life together. This church 
is a gift that God has given to you to encourage you, to strengthen you, to build you up. The very times when you're tempted not to come to church are the times you need to be here. And I hope the church will always be a place that will be filled with people that will look beyond the fine, I'm doing fine, and we'll see your heart. And someone will take you into a room and pray with you and put their arms around you and encourage you and bless you. Stay close to the church and you have a greater chance of staying close to Jesus. I had over 30 years, 35 years of being in the church. I've seen people come and go sad i've seen some even say for the sake of my christianity i'm leaving the church i think i can do better on my own maybe they didn't like something that went on or they didn't like this or they didn't like that and out of protest they leave the church without exception without exception it has not gone well for them i've never met anyone that has done better outside the church than in the church. The church has got its problems. There's no question about that. But do not judge God by His church. Don't judge God by the members of the church. Don't judge God by the pastors of the church. It is bigger than that. Decide now. To commit yourself to Christ's church. It's what he left behind. It's what he knew you needed. And he said, I will not withhold any gift that the church needs. He said, all of those gifts are for one thing. For building up the body of Christ. I know there are people down on the church, but they don't get it from Jesus. They don't get it from him. In the church... We come together to work together. We meet together. We worship together. We pray together. The great commands of the Bible can only be fulfilled in the context of the church. You must embrace God's body. You can't be a part of God's body and not connect with His church. Even the scripture says, How could that happen? How could a finger or a hand or a toe not be connected? You know what happens? It dies. Decide now to support God's church with your time by serving here. Decide now to support God's church by your finances, by giving here. This is, of all the the things to do with your resources, You will never get a greater return on your investment than investing in God's work. In fact, I want to challenge you to decide to support God's church by being in a house of worship every Sabbath. I get the whole alone thing, but you don't have to do that on Sabbath morning when God's people are gathering. Stay in his church. Number four, I want to invite you to stay in his vineyard. Stay in his vineyard. I believe what really makes the difference here, why the church is different today than maybe what it was, because... The devil tries to get the church to do anything but what it's called to do. Everything is created for a purpose, and the church is no exception. There is a purpose for which God brought forth the church, and that is to help lead men and women to become a part of God's kingdom. It is at the heart of what we do. Everything we do has to fit that test. It may be a good thing, it may be a noble thing, but if it doesn't lead us 
in forwarding and growing God's kingdom, it's not the work of the church. It may be the work, somebody's personal work. It may be the work of another agency or whatever else. But this work is unique. And that's what I think really makes the difference here. It's not the name tags that we ask you to wear every week. It's not the lunch that we are going to share in just a few minutes every Sabbath. What makes the difference in Ellicott City right now, what has breathed new life into this church is a commitment to the vineyard. That we are the son that God invites to go work in the vineyard. And we have answered that call. It'll be easy in the coming weeks and months and years to say we're tired. It'll be easy to look around the church and say, well, you know what, we're pretty full. We don't need any other people. It would be easier in the coming months to say all of that money that we spent trying to reach people in our community, it could be better spent on us. Those decisions have been made so often by so many churches And it would be the beginning of death. It will lead to spiritual death. You were created for this purpose. It is what we are authorized to do. We are commissioned to go. Never lose sight of that. Never, ever lose sight of that. It is the missionary spirit that lives here today that has made all the difference in the world. Hold on to that. Foster that. Nurture that. The best way you can show your love for Christ is not by how much you can give. It is not by how much work you can do. The greatest way to show your love for Christ is to share Christ with someone else. Someone for whom Christ died. To love the Lord enough to love the one for whom he died but does not know him. It is what we're about. To tell them of God's love. To tell them of God's grace. To tell them of God's plan to save them. Staying faithful to Jesus is about being faithful to his vineyard. It is where we are called to go and it is where we are to remain until the harvest is over. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I don't get that. I don't get it. It's not a problem that there are too few laborers, as my friend Derek Morris would say, too few laboring laborers. There are plenty of people There are plenty of people that take the name of Jesus, but they don't share the name of Jesus or the message of Jesus. It has been an incredible privilege to be a part of a church that has re-engaged in that. I go back to the meeting that we had the first time my wife and I met with the leadership team and we talked about where we were at. And let me tell you, there were there are problems. There are always problems. There are always challenges. There's always these things. And we talked for a few minutes, not ignoring the reality of what was going on, but we weren't going to be overwhelmed with it. And it didn't take very long to begin to talk about, but where do we want to go? What do we want the future to be like? And it didn't take very long for your leadership team unanimously to say, we want to to be about leading others to know Jesus. I mean, it, it wasn't anything that they didn't have. It's just that you can be overwhelmed with the problems and the challenges that you forget that. And we made a commitment that that's what we were going to be about. And then I asked them to do something to put that commitment into action And that night we voted to do our first evangelistic meeting. 
I don't know how many I've done since I've been here, but it's been a lot. We said in 90 days, we're going to do an evangelistic meeting. I know they could, maybe some of them, they've never said it, some of them may have been thinking, what is that guy thinking? You know, we're not, we're not, in a, we're not ready financially, you know, we're struggling, we got, we've got issues with different things, we got all, I, you know what, there could have been, we, if I had a blackboard, there could have been at least 21 reasons why we shouldn't have done what we did. And I, and I acknowledge that. Every, all of that is true. But there was something very powerful to say. This is what we believe God's call is, and now we're going to begin to move in that direction. And so we stepped out in faith. And we had a meeting. I think, Charles, that was your meeting, if I'm not mistaken. That very first meeting, Terry, I think you were in that meeting. I don't even know how many others. But in every meeting along the way, God has enlarged our family. God has brought some kindred spirits together. And it's been a joy. Don't lose that. Because as you look around, what would we trade away for Charles? What would, we, what would somebody give for him? If I were to say to you, we spent $15,000 of our hard-earned money to have the meeting that Charles came to. Anybody want the fifteen grand? No, I don't think so. That's the way it is. It, it is what matters most here, people, lives. What would we not do to reach one soul? I can't help being filled with thoughts of who are the next Charles? Who are the next Terry's? Who are the next fill in the blank? God has given us, I didn't, I didn't even look at the number, I was hoping something would happen, but it didn't, and that's okay. I've got what I need. Because every decision that has been made, we've taken a picture of. And the other night, I was looking through some of those pictures of people that have been baptized over the years. And it's just, it, it just takes you to tears. Stay in this vineyard. We woke up this morning with a place to come. Others woke up this morning with nothing to do. No Christ in their heart. And so the time has come for me to leave. And I'm asking you to stay. Stay in his word. Stay in his spirit. Stay in his church. And stay in his vineyard. I'm going to try to get through it. Number 6, verse 24, and on says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. If you'll be faithful to what I've called you to this morning, you and I, We'll never have to say goodbye again.